Good evening, everybody. Round two, round two of our Lenten series this year of uh, 2022. Um, and somebody, somebody was saying before before our service here tonight too. Um, I'm going to try and remember put put the schedule. Not that it's the the earth shattering important thing to do, but to say, oh, next week I think Pastor Schultz will be here, and after that I don't know, and so it'd just be good. Oh, if I remember, going to put that in on on Sunday's bulletin so that so that you're aware of that. So, uh, continuing on our our theme for this year, the crucial hours when you're looking at the uh, events and the happenings that were going on with Jesus Christ and and uh, him fulfilling his heavenly Father's plan of salvation, um, focusing on that. And so, everything should be in your service folder up on the screen. Are we up there, Ben? You ready to go? There it is. Okay. So let's begin. Let's begin our service here tonight. I'm on the top of page two of the hard copy. We begin our Lenten worship in the name of the Father, our Creator, Provider, and Gracious Preserver. We begin in the name of the Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier, who creates and strengthens faith through the Gospel. Grab a hymnal. Let's sing our first hymn tonight, hymn 102, just verses 1 through 3 at this time. kindly stand right you think about this what what we do in 99.9 .9 percent of our corporate public worship services right at the beginning of services we confess our sins ask God for forgiveness and assured and, and you know I think what a, what what a more direct thing to remember during Lent confessing our sins and say oh thankfully our Savior Jesus has done everything for them so let's join together in this responsive section, page 2. Dear friends, let us humbly and honestly confess our sins to God our Father, asking him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am naturally sinful and that I repeatedly disobey your commands in the thoughts I have, the words I speak, and the actions I take or do not take. 
I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. Because of my disobedience to your holy will, I deserve your punishment, both now during my life and in hell for eternity. But I am sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me and forgive me, because I am a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has shown his gracious love to all people by sending his only Son, Jesus, to be the forgiving sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by the same authority God gives to all Christians, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We do trust and believe this promise. As we are reminded in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us now show our thankfulness to God for this grace by stopping those sins we have just confessed. May we humbly live all of our lives according to his will and commands, in the peace and comfort which this forgiveness gives us. Let us sing more praise to our Lord. Please be seated and we'll sing verses 4 and 5 of that same hymn, hymn 102. refer to that uh, second part of uh, the hard copies that you should have received, the Passion History. Remember the harmony, the harmony of the Gospels combining all of the information that the four Gospels give, give us about um, the Passion History of our Lord, and so that's why you won't see any verse numbers or anything like this. It's a compilation of all that information. So we are on Monday, Thursday evening here on Passion Reading number two. Jesus told, his, told the disciples, Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. And 
Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, Could you men not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. And Peter struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. But Jesus answered, Put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Who is it you want? Jesus of I am he. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he has spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those who gave me. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Jesus said, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Grab a hymnal again. Let's sing our next hymn. This is hymn 351. We'll sing verses 1 and 2.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Compromise. When you hear that word compromise, what picture comes to mind? A picture comes to my mind usually of situations that really don't pertain to me directly. Compromise. I think maybe in my brain, I think of a compromise when there's negotiations going on. When you ever hear that word, negotiations, that means, oh, probably something kind of supposed to be kind of important going on. They're negotiating. Maybe they're negotiating between the Ukraine and Russia, right? If somebody is going to, two sides are going to try and come to an agreement, isn't there going to have to be a compromise on the part of both sides? Maybe there is some compromising going on between, in the baseball world, between baseball owners and baseball players. The baseball players union to compromise means that you give in a little bit. You concede something on one side and the other side also concedes, hopefully bringing both sides to a compromise, a compromising agreement. Do you realize really how much, how often compromising plays into our daily lives? Sit and putting some thoughts together for, for tonight. And think, you know, really, right? The Hirsches, the Hirsches are compromising shoppers. We're sale shoppers. And I thought of it and said, oh, right, right. Whenever you go into the store, you go to the grocery store and you buy something on sale, isn't some compromising going on? If Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries is usually $3.49 a box, but it's on sale for $2.99, right? Isn't the store compromising a price? You call it a sale, It'd be a compromise. I do a whole lot of compromising when I'm looking for a different vehicle. I don't know that I'm ever going to walk into a dealer and say, I'm going to order this and this and this with all these options, options, options. You're looking for a different car, a used car. There's a lot of compromising that goes on. There's some uncompromising ideas. I'm not going to compromise on cruise control. I want cruise control. I'm not going to compromise on air conditioning. Color, eh. Style, eh, maybe. Sunroof, moonroof, eh. Depends on the situation. I can compromise. Those aren't necessarily deal breakers. You compromise to find a vehicle that works for you. Compromising at home, right? You're going to paint the living room. Dear wife thinks, oh, I like this color. Husband thinks this color is their compromising to say what color is the living room going to be compromising. It really happens very, very often in our daily lives. Just a second here. I'm going to read through a few verses from Luke chapter 23. And I want you to keep that concept in mind to say where is compromise being attempted? Where is compromising being denied? And I want you to mentally keep track. And I'll give you a little heads up. My opinion, there are three examples of compromising involved with compromising or not compromising going on in our text. Because our theme for tonight is the reality and that in this plan of salvation that God has laid out from eternity, no compromising is crucial so that that plan of salvation is carried out. So keep that in mind. See if you can see three different instances. Sometimes it's indirect or very direct. And you won't find the word compromise in there. But keep that concept in mind as we read through Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 24. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he, sent, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. 
Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. It's our text. It's a busy 24 hours, basically, when you look from Monday, Thursday, noon to the third Monday, Thursday afternoon to Good Friday afternoon. Our lector and reading, our responsive reading included part of that, that reality of the, the events that were going on in those busy 24 hours of Monday, Thursday, sometime, Jesus commanding, telling his disciples, go find a, a, a spot for us so that we can celebrate the Passover, all of the events that happened in the upper room. Would have been a busy time for the disciples to prepare that, being up there. We usually think of Jesus instituting his Lord's Supper, okay, but primarily he was there for the Passover, to be obedient to that Old Testament law. While they're up there, Jesus showed that incredible example of humility, washing his disciples' feet. Same upper room, same time. Jesus preached four chapters in John, teaching his disciples what was going to be going on in the very, very near future. Busy time up there in the upper room. Judas left at some point while they're in the upper room. Then we get to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus and his disciples, his three best friends, you could say Peter, James, and John, going a little further. Jesus praying three times like we read. Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. After that arrest, taken to his first trial. The religious trial before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish church council. Convicted of blasphemy, but the Jews couldn't kill anybody, execute anybody, so they took him to Pilate. This is all in the same 24 hours. Going on the civil trial before the Roman governor. He claims to be a king. He's leading a coup against the Roman emperor, against Caesar. Pilate wanted nothing to do with this. Tried to pawn Jesus off onto Herod. Goes to a little different kind of trial. Herod didn't want anything to do. Sent them back to Pilate, which is where we get to here. So do you see some compromising, some attempts at compromising in the verses here in Luke 23? I would say Pilate. I mentioned before, Pilate was in a pickle. Pilate was between a rock and a hard place. He knew legally that there was no legal reason to have Jesus arrested or much less to have him executed. He had done nothing wrong. The Jews claimed he committed a religious crime. Okay, you Jews, if he did something wrong in your life, go ahead, take him. Did you see how Pilate was throwing out a compromise, right? In our text there, Verse 6, 15 and 16, Pilate says to the Jews, he has done nothing to deserve death, therefore I will punish him and then release him. Isn't that at least an attempt at a compromise? To try and placate those bloodthirsty Jews when you look at the type of punishment that Jesus had already gone through and what the Romans were used to giving, the, the flogging, the scourging, the handle with, with leather thongs and nails and glass tied into those leather thongs. It was an excruciating, terrible kind of punishment that Jesus had endured, would endure. Can you see the logic between Pilate's trying to placate and, and please the crowd? To say, ah, it's not quite death, but it, it's pretty close to death, pretty close to execution. People who are going through that scourging oftentimes would wish they were dead. It was so terrible. The Jews have got to give in to this, right? That we look at this compromise of Pilate and say, oh, we see it failed, but right? Because then you look at the Jews' response and they were not going to compromise anything, right? No, 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 this scourge is not good enough. Crucify him, crucify him. I would say those are two of the three 
that enter my mind. And whenever I think about this episode and I think about those Jews and, and the aspect of them not compromising them all, not giving in at all, this whole process that those Jews were doing in this, this mob, this crowd, I figuratively, figuratively give them a nasty look and say, why in the world were you doing this? What did Jesus do, humanly speaking, that gets you so riled up that you would work so hard to get an innocent man crucified? Why would they do that? It goes to the level of hatred. And in the same sense that I personally would ask that question of the Jews, it's going to seem awful weird. I would also follow that thought I had of why would you do that, Jews? But then also say, thank you, Jews, for doing that. Why in the world would you say thank you, honestly say thank you, Jews, for doing that? For being such an instrumental part in the torture, the crucifixion, the execution of a completely innocent man, why would you say thank you? And I would say it all goes into this plan of salvation that God has laid out from eternity where there could be no compromises, right? When you think of all of these plans, all of these prophecies that God had laid out from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, say not one point of that whole plan of salvation could be compromised. It needed to happen in exactly the ways that it did. How many scriptural references aren't referring to this rejection, that are referring to the execution, that are referring to the torture that Jesus would endure? There could be no compromise in this plan of salvation. You go earlier, you go earlier back in the Gospel of St. Luke, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was preaching at his home church there in Nazareth. The Jews didn't like it, and here's what they did. Luke chapter 4. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him, that's Jesus, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Right? No compromise? Sure. Was Jesus the Messiah? Yeah, there was the Messiah there. Sure. Was Jesus the Messiah supposed to die? Yeah. But he wasn't supposed to die in Nazareth, nor was he supposed to die by being thrown off a cliff. Those would have been compromises, right? God's plan of salvation had to be carried out like he laid it out. And it's interesting. You read in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19, Right? All of these nasty things that were happening to Jesus and the way that they were happening to Jesus. John says in chapter 19, These things happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Isaiah 53, right? 2 also talks about Jesus, the lamb being despised, being rejected. And so in this roundabout way, can't we say thank you to the Jews for their nastiness to Jesus as they were fulfilling these prophecies, these plans that God had laid out? God didn't paint them into a corner to do this by any means, but God did know what was going to be happening. And according to his wisdom, this is how it was played out in order to carry out our plan of salvation. And so you think about this whole thing about compromise. Jesus Christ, that's last week on Ash Wednesday, had the privilege and opportunity to talk about Jesus and his crucial obedience. Right? Why was it? When you think of Jesus and that crucial obedience, obedience that we saw specifically in the upper room, carrying out that celebration of the Passover, you think of the crucial obedience of Jesus Christ throughout his entire life. You think not once, not once, Jesus being true man, being tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin, did he compromise his holiness? 
And you think about the motivation for why that is. And we're getting stuck on that word compromise. Because you think of it us, you think of myself, you think of yourself, and when we're honestly, bluntly honest with ourselves, isn't it true that we compromise God's holy laws each and every day? Again, I usually don't think of that word when I think of my disobedience to God's holy will. But here's God saying, you be sinless and perfect. Adam and Eve, Paul Hirsch, you be sinless, perfect, and holy. And don't we compromise that? Each and every time I say, forget God's law, forget those commandments, I'm going to do what I want to do, we compromise God's holy will each and every day, so many times each and every day. And what a privilege, what a joy it is to do this Lenten thing, to do this Jesus thing as often as we do, to remember, thankfully, that Jesus did not compromise one bit of his holiness, one bit of God's plan of salvation. Why? Because you and I do compromise it each and every day. Jesus did for us what you and I cannot do for ourselves, defeat sin and Satan. That you think of all of our sins, the sins of all of mankind on that cross of Calvary. Even there, Jesus not compromising his holiness, not compromising that plan of salvation that his heavenly Father has laid out. And you think about crucial hours, right? Crucial hours, crucial time, crucial events that Jesus carried out for us. That's what especially we look at at these, these weeks, these days of Lent, preparing our hearts for that, that last week of Jesus' life, carrying out those crucial times, those crucial events. The, really, the pinnacle of Jesus, of, of the Heavenly Father's plan of salvation, entering Jerusalem, Willingly going to the cross, gloriously rising from the grave on Easter Sunday. And so, because of all that uncompromising that our Savior Jesus does, that's why we say, right? No compromising, no compromising in that plan of salvation is so very crucial for each and every one of us. So we thank God. Thank God that he sent his uncompromising son to do for what we compromise time after time, disobeying his will, forgiving our sins, giving us the peace, the hope, the security, knowing sins are forgiven through Jesus and we have an eternal home waiting for us in heaven. Hallelujah. No compromising for this crucial salvation through Jesus. Amen. Would you kindly stand? And now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach that eternal home in heaven. Amen. Let's join together. Uh, let's stay standing for our, our next hymn there, hymn 351, verses 3 and 4. So grab a hymnal again, 351, verses 3 and 4.
We're continuing to do the offering thing. The plates are in the back. We're not going to bring them up this evening, Joel. So just be aware if you haven't placed your thank offerings, they're still, still in the back. Let's join together in our responsive prayer. I'm on the back side, page four of the hard copy. At the end of our worship in the closing, and in the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray for the benefit and blessing of people everywhere, the growth of your congregations here in our Nebraska district, in our Wisconsin Synod, and in all the world. Strengthen all who serve and worship here. We pray for all people and ask you to send your blessings on us all throughout our lives. Lord, have mercy. We know that our earthly and spiritual blessings come only from you. Use the gifts of our time, talents, and treasures to promote and increase your kingdom. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Please be seated, and let's give our attention to the choir upstairs.
Thanks, choir, for sharing your time and talents with the rest of us. And I'm sure I speak for everybody here. We appreciate that. Thank you. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's grab a hymnal one last time tonight. Hymn 591 is our closing hymn for tonight. Good evening again. Thank you. Appreciate that. I have nothing extra to announce with you this evening other than we collect both of these things. The, the service folder and the passion history will be used uh, in the future. But I always say, say, if you really want to put one or both in your hope chest or keep it for safekeeping for the future or whatever, nobody's going to force it out of your hands. But uh, they will get used again in the future, so keep that in mind. Blessings on your Wednesday night here and the remainder of your weeks, and God willing, we'll see you back here in God's house this weekend. Good night.